My name is uh, Glenn McIntosh, and uh, I was one of the co-animation supervisor on uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and uh, we're here at the VIEW Conference 2018. So, first of all, what do you think of this conference here in Turin, Italy? It's amazing in the sense that you, you get to uh, interact with the, the students and the fans uh, so closely, and then uh, you also get the opportunity to learn from uh, so many talented uh, filmmakers uh, that also come here to this uh, conference, and you realize they're just as passionate about the, the work as you are. So in that respect, you end up making a lot of friends because uh, you are interested in all the same things that they are. And when it comes to the students, a lot of these are aspiring animators and, and visual effects people. Can you talk about the global nature of this business? Uh, what's amazing is how it has become a, a global business uh, and how much uh, animation uh, has affected the, the, uh, the, the art of, of filmmaking and how uh, regardless of what language, language you know, animation sp spans uh, all of that. Uh, you, there's animation classes in schools around the world now where you can uh, take, you know, study uh, feature animation and uh, CG has um, leveled the playing field in the sense that uh, there's so many artists now that have the opportunity to create CG animation and uh, a lot of the studios work in Maya and so you have a lot of opportunities to go between the various studios uh, because they're using the same technology, they're using the same uh, models and assets. So minimal uh, pick up between you know like the work that you would need to learn to when you arrive at a new studio but so much of the work now is uh, cross-pollinated you've got uh, visual effects companies uh, there's like you, you could have a gigantic movie like Infinity War where you've got 15 to 20 visual effects houses all helping out on the same project uh, and so uh, from you know from all over the world it's not just specific to uh, uh, North America there's a uh, a, a huge visual effects industry in, in London, England, for example. Uh, and so um, uh, to, to see that uh, grow is, is incredibly exciting. So. so ILMX Lab has been here the last couple of last three years and I want to get your thoughts on how you're seeing real time uh, impact things, especially with video game engines now being used like Unreal Engine 4 mm -hmm. to, to bring some of these uh, big screen creations to life. Yeah, it's it's staggering the, uh, uh, the how the, the amount of technology that is being leveled at uh, you know what we're seeing now I would imagine that in 10 years uh, kids who uh, you know we would typically play a video game with uh, you know like a console uh, and a, or a controller and, and then from what I've seen from the VR work and like how much you're actually doing it you're actually holding a gun or holding a lightsaber or doing all these things that you only imagined of when you were a kid watching the Star Wars films and now you're actually able to contribute and be in a Star Wars film which is just a completely different uh, uh, experience and so the, the idea that that is being offered and delivered to the audiences nowadays I, I think is going to uh, uh, change the landscape of, of visual entertainment in, in the coming years. Yeah, we definitely need a Jurassic uh, World, Jurassic Park VR experience like yeah. that. Yeah, well, we, we had the opportunity to do a, uh, um, there's like a, a Jurassic experience that we was, was released in conjunction uh, with uh, Fallen Kingdom. And uh, when it's amazing because when you put on those goggles and the T-Rex leans down, you, you get a, a, a fantastic impression of just how gigantic these animals really were that you don't necessarily get when you're watching a movie. So uh, to, uh, I, I think that is really uh, not only entertaining, but it's very educational because it shows you how enormous these animals were and it gives you a better sense of you know, how uh, majestic they were as well. And I think that's part of the goal of the Jurassic films is to not give the impression that they're monsters, but they're, you know, they're living animals. And uh, when you go to a, a, a museum, you, you can see just how, how big they were. But you're, of course, you're just looking at the bones. You're, you, you don't realize like how much bigger they are when they're covered in skin and muscle and the, the claws that you're seeing would have been covered in keratin and so everything that you're seeing is just that much magnified and that much bigger when you see it in real life. So the, the, the VR experience really helps to um, uh, embellish that so that you get an impression of 
uh, how gigantic they were, and, and it's, it's hard to believe how, how incredible Mother Nature is when you're standing against something that's that big. So. Jurassic World also had a video game that came out in tandem. Is that something you were able to check out or play at all? No, unfortunately, I, I was so busy uh, trying to finish the film. It was a uh, they, that was that, that was a full time uh, experience because I was also uh, working um, with like Image Engine that was doing uh, development work. Uh, as well as uh, um, a, like a couple of like Jurassic commercials and a commercial for Universal Studios that we were doing as well as uh, the actual movie. So there's so many dinosaur projects that were on the go, but it's it's something I would I really look forward to playing. Yeah, that's something. Also, we're going to be seeing a brand new Jurassic Park uh, ride at Universal yes. Studios coming yeah. soon. Yeah, that looks fantastic, and it's uh, I, I can't wait to say you know, like what they uh, do to it with all the technology that they have at their disposal now. And uh, they're so good at, 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 you know, Universal is so good at making those uh, rides so interactive and dynamic. So I can't wait to see, you know, what dinosaurs will make the cut and, and uh, how that'll be incorporated into the actual ride itself. How uh, far has technology come, even from when you were working on Jurassic Park 3 to the more recent films? I would say the, 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 the renders, it, exponentially gotten you know not only faster but more detailed as far as the environment that we put on the creatures and by that I mean like the dirt the grass you know how wet their skin looks how if it's covered in mud or grease or blood or you know like but just getting more of their environment on them and I think you saw that uh, especially in the Jurassic fight between the Indominus and the T-Rex at the end of Jurassic World that just sort of helped embed them in their environment. But even so much as uh, Blue, when she's on the operating table, getting uh, makeup called Fuller's Earth and just uh, padding the underside of the puppet with, you know, dirt, because that's what you would see on an ostrich. You know, if you caught an ostrich uh, and tranquilized it, its feet wouldn't be clean. They'd be dirty and covered in, in muck. And from all the uh, photography I've seen of these animals, that you know, real live animals aren't perfectly clean. They're, they're dirty and messy. And so we wanted to um, incorporate that into the dinosaurs so that they didn't, uh, they weren't so clean, but they had a history to them. So there might be scars on them to sure to show that they were in battles or that they had, they had sort of grown up in this like rough existence, either fighting, you know, animals of their own kind or, or other like larger dinosaurs. Uh, and then as far as the performance goes, we actually did motion capture for uh, a lot of the dinosaurs, especially the bipeds, uh, like the raptors, uh, the T-Rex, the uh, Indominus Rex. And uh, that was invaluable as far as quickly blocking out the action, but you also get like a foundation of the performance uh, that you never had before. But there's an improv quality as well because you're able to do multiple takes very quickly and get all those takes in front of the director, whether it's Colin Trevorrow or Juan Antonio Bayona, and in a way that you would if you were just filming the actor. You're, you're sort of experimenting with the animation in the same way you would experiment with the acting and letting them do improv. And so that op opens things up uh, exponentially from a performance point of view where you're not locked into one specific performance, but you're trying different things. And the entire time you're trying to find like a foundation of the performance by looking at what real animals are doing. There's an economy of movement to what real animal movement. Uh, real animals don't roar before they pounce on something. Uh, they, um, and, and so it's, as much as possible, it's looking at uh, BBC documentary footage, uh, footage shot at zoos, uh, and looking at animals of uh, comparable size. Uh, so for example, the mid-sized dinosaurs, like uh, Triceratops, uh, Stegosaurus, or an Ankylosaurus, we looked at rhinos. Uh, rhinos are around two to three tons. They have, you know, big, thick head ornamentation. Uh, and they were a perfect reference for the kind of movements uh, that we needed uh, for the larger uh, giant sauropods like the brachiosaurus and the apatosauruses, we looked at elephants. And the idea there is that an elephant can, can't technically run, they can only walk fast because they're so enormous. Uh, an elephant can't have all four feet off the ground at the same time and we applied that same rule uh, to them. So even though there's a volcano exploding and a pyroclastic flow is racing down the mountain, they're only able to do a, a really fast run. And it's exactly like what an elephant would have been able to do. And 
even with that, we're because of their sheer size, we're able to get a really dynamic uh, or fast walk. Because of their size, they're covering so much ground with each step. So they're still able to walk at like 17 to 20 miles an hour. And then you put like a dynamic camera on that, and then you shake the camera because of the earthquake that the volcano is causing. And you can still make the, the action really dynamic, even though you know you think, oh, well, it's a walk, but it's not. It's a you're, it's a gigantic animal racing past camera, and within that, you're also building up layers of movement because you've got uh, the Gallimimus, which is based on an ostrich racing past the camera like 45 miles an hour, and then you've got the mid-sized dinosaurs, which are bipeds, like the Allosaurus, uh, or even the T-Rex is based on an ostrich, but just slowed down, like if. If an ostrich weighed seven tons, that's what it would move like as well. So we're constantly referencing uh, uh, animals of the natural world and incorporating them into the action. So how does that play a role when you're creating your own dinosaurs over the last two films? Brand, brand new man-made concoctions. So, yeah, sort of our, uh, like the Indominus and the Indoraptor are kind of our Frankenstein uh, dinosaurs, but we're still trying to find a foundation of performance uh, uh, within them. Uh, for I know that for the Indoraptor, it's supposed to be a little bit off, a little bit tweaked. Uh, and uh, like one of those, uh, the, the older zoos, there would be animals that they would, their cage would be too small and they would just be pacing back and forth and they're almost insane. Um, there was a, a photograph that I found of um, a World War I soldier with PTSD and um, you feel sorry for him, but you also realize that the, there's, his, he isn't quite there and his, his, there's a, um, a, a scariness to, to the look in his eyes. And I showed that to uh, J.A. and J.A. was like, wow, that's really interesting. We, if we could get that look on the dinosaur, we, we, we've got something very interesting. And then on top of that, we're incorporating like little ticks and movements. Uh, like if, if uh, so if you'll notice like the Indoraptor kind of like shakes, almost like it's, it has like spasms because it isn't this perfectly created Dinosaur. It's it is like Frankenstein. It's it, it's not um, an animal that is uh, um, perfectly healthy. It's a little bit off. Uh, and then the Indominus Rex, uh, it had raptor DNA in it, and so it was uh, really smart. And it was so it was. It, we looked at a lot of predators that uh, are very calculating. So it meant looking at birds of prey, looking at ravens, looking at uh, herons when they're uh, uh, hunting and sort of like finding the timing, because timing helps define uh, character. And so like how long they, it would take to do something or how long it would stare at something before attacking. Uh, all of those little moments that sort of add up where you're, you're, you're building character uh, into the dinosaur's performance to make, try and make it feel as real as possible and not feel monstrous. Uh, that was always something that we tried to shy away from is that it can, uh, you know, a, an animal can be very scary without it, you know, sort of becoming into the, the, the trap of, of becoming like a movie monster. So it's um, staying away from those, those aspects of it. And, and if you make it feel like a real animal, it's ultimately going to feel scarier anyway. If it reminds you of uh, a, a living animal, like a saltwater crocodile or something that is genuinely scary, if we can sort of key in on that, I think it's... it's a more interesting uh, a creature that is going to make the the audience uh, more scared. And speaking of more scared, I mean the the whole sequence uh, in the the house is very mm -hmm. scary. But but even looking towards the end sequence, where you're bringing the dinosaurs into our world, mm -hmm. how, how has the evolution of CGI and special effects kind of led up to this? Oh uh, well, it's what's been fascinating is. Just in the past 25 years, we've been able to witness the evolution of modern visual effects, where we've sort of gone from like Ray Harryhausen style of stop motion to the go motion that Phil Tippett and Dennis developed on Dragon Slayer and uh, Empire Strikes Back to Jurassic uh, Park. Uh, and so that, the, the work in that is still so impressive. And you know, how do you build on that? How do you embellish on that? And uh, a lot of it is in, is how you film, how you frame and film a character, uh, how how you uh, um, assign um, composition to it to imply something might happen off screen left if you give more room to it screen right. Uh, there's a lot of like cinematic tricks that you're doing to to scare the audience, and uh, Colin Trevorrow and Juan Antonio Bayona are, are masters of that. 
of being able to like you know knowing what to do to, to scare an audience and I think the Jurassic films hold a distinction where they're uh, adventure movies with elements of horror and it's being able to walk that fine line I, I know that Colin some of the actions that we had done almost bordered on, on gory and he said no they need to be intense and scary but not gory that's that's the distinction because uh, you also want kids to be able to enjoy these movies and I remember enjoying Jaws when I was probably too young to see it but uh, that's why I loved the movie because it excited my imagination and uh, I think a lot of it was, you know, in, in what you didn't see. And so uh, we have to be, you know, careful not to show too much of the animal because a lot of that is filled in by the audience's imagination. So uh, in Jurassic World, for example, when the Indominus Rex eats a guy, we didn't want to show it too much of it, so Colin suggested we cover it up with palm fronds. So it's the same animation of, you know, this horrible event that's going on, but you're almost kind of trying to peek through the palm fronds and Colin's not letting you see it, which I thought was uh, a, an amazing uh, uh, decision to sort of show off like you're, you're trying to see what's, what's happening, but it's almost so horrible that we won't let you see it. So, and it's, uh, and uh, uh, J.A. Uh, did that throughout the second half of Fallen Kingdom, where the first half is, it's, it's almost like two different movies, where the first half is just this absolute race to get off the island and it's just an exercise in, in uh, incredible uh, action and direction. And then the second half of the movie becomes almost like the, the killer in the house that they're trying to get away from and, and just slows everything down and makes it much more intense and uh, you can see how much of that is affected by the, uh, the performance and the character of the Indoraptor and how calculating it is and how much of a, it's stalking its prey. Uh, similar to uh, what I was saying is with the herons and the ravens and there's, there's an intelligence behind the stalking which I think makes them scarier as opposed to just a, a mindless uh, chomping machine.